Well, I want to continue sharing on the subject of Jubilee and why we have Jubilee and specifically what is Jubilee. It is not just another conference or meeting or gathering, but it is a week of celebration. It's a week of, of celebrating and giving God thanks for all the wonderful things he's done in our lives and in our church. And the original vision came out of two things in scripture. We'll look at both today. The first one is the 10 lepers. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there to Luke chapter 17. We'll start in verse 11. But the 10 lepers, and God spoke to me out of that in regards to us as a church and other churches. One of the things I'm having visions of and dreams again is other churches joining up with us in this week of celebration for their churches and what God's doing in their churches. And then the second one was Abraham and Isaac and the offering of Isaac and how God spoke to Abraham. So let's look at the first one, Thanksgiving. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice, not a soft voice, not a whisper, a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Man, I just, I need to keep reading, but that just arrests me to this day. Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. So there's so many good things that we can extract out of those passages that'll build our faith. But one of the things I want to bring attention to is that Jesus spoke to all 10 and said, go show yourself to the priest because in a, a cleansing of that nature, a healing of that nature, they had to show themselves to the, to the priest. That was part, part, of the, part of the protocol of the law. And so Jesus believed they were healed and told them, go show yourself to the, to the priest. And only one came back giving thanks. And I love Jesus's mind, the mind of Christ. The difference between the mind of Jesus, the mind of Christ, and the mind of even the average believer, Jesus didn't look at the one and go, what a bummer, only one got healed. No, he said, where's the other nine? He saw them healed by faith. He mixed faith with their faith and they were healed as they went. He didn't see them physically healed, but he knew all 10 were healed. And why is there only one returning to give thanks? Saints, I can tell you over the years, decades of ministry, that it's just amazed me at how people can get healed of cancer. They can get healed of, of a disease or on and on. I could give testimonies of people receiving from the grace of God and being healed and so little thanksgiving. I've even seen people come to our church, get healed and never join a church, never come back to church. Never, man, I don't know about you, but if I had terminal cancer and I got healed at church, I'd show up the next service. I'd be showing up for quite a few months for nothing else. Well, I don't like that church. Well, I like giving God thanks publicly, hallelujah. I like giving God glory publicly. I like giving God praise publicly for all the good things in our lives. And not only the public expression of the lack of thanksgiving, but just people's lives, the lack of thanksgiving. And we have so much to be thankful for. And again, it puzzled me, how could nine people with something that was a death sentence, leprosy was a death sentence in that culture. And to be totally cleansed of it, as you're going to show yourself to the priest, 
How could all 10 not return and fall at the feet of Jesus and say thanks? Yet, how many times do we not give thanks for our marriages? Do we not give thanks for our children? Do we not give thanks for our churches? Man, I tell you, it's easy to murmur and complain about church. Okay, in some places, it's easy to murmur <laughs> and complain about church. There's always something you can see that's wrong and meditate on that and be ungrateful and be unthankful, but it takes faith. And when you're in Bible faith, you'll always have thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is how you measure your degree of, of faith you're operating in in your walk with the Lord. It is impossible to have faith and not give thanks. It's impossible to maintain what you receive from God and not be thankful. You know, even in the natural, I was taught when anyone does something for you or helps you, it's plum polite. It's just plain polite to say thank you. But the lack of saying thanks to God is amazing to me. So I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm trying to encourage you, be thankful. I'm trying to encourage you, give thanks and make a conscious effort personally to give thanks. And as a church, I don't wanna be nine out of 10 churches that God Almighty is blessing that is allowing us to be a part of a third great awakening and not just set some time aside as a church and say, thank you for all the miracles. Thank you for the signs and wonders. Thank you for the growth. Thank you for the life. Thank you for the worship team. I know Satan fell into the choir when he got kicked out, but we kicked him out here in Jesus name. Thank you for the choir. Thank you for this and thank you for that. Thank you for the hospitality uh, and people that are stepping up in hospitality. Thank you for people that care about us. We need to give thanks, saints, and we need to honestly do it from the heart as an act of faith. Go to Romans chapter one. Let me read this quickly. We won't, we won't go into detail there, but the beginning of the end, the beginning of an apostate mind is not giving God thanks. In Romans chapter one, verse 18, Romans chapter one, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is what we see in our culture today is people are not content with rejecting God personally. They're not content with being disobedient to God personally, they want to suppress the truth in their unrighteousness because the devil knows even when the church doesn't know that if you'll continue in the word of God, if you'll continue in truth, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So our media outlets have to suppress the truth to keep people enslaved. Satan has to lie and lie really good and lie upon lying to enslave the masses. So a part of good church culture is the truth and celebrating the truth. And listen, if nothing else, you ought to come to church and you ought to say, thank God there's one place I can go where I can hear the truth because you're basically not gonna hear it anywhere else in this culture right now. And we need to be thankful for the truth. Man, you are where you are because of the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be thankful every time we hear it. Thank God for the truth. So these people who are bent in unrighteousness suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So everybody knows there's a God. Everybody knows and has a conscience on right and, and wrong. And everybody knows when they are rejecting the truth, when they're rejecting the attributes of God. But look at this, what happened to them? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but become futile in their thoughts 
and their foolish hearts were darkened. Notice that because they did not glorify God, nor did they give him thanks, they did not retain God. It goes on to say in verse 22, professing to be wise, and it might not be in my notes up there, but professing to be wise, they became fools. Does anybody know of people in the culture that act like they're brilliant when they're blooming fools? I mean, it's like people say things like it's so smart and we've, we've, we've evolved into some illumination of truth. And you're listening going, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's what happens when you reject God. That's what happens when you won't glorify him as God and you become unthankful. You do not retain God now in your, in your mind. You become foolish and you change the glory of God, of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creepy things and global warming. And on and on it could go <laughs> with the worship of the planet instead of the creator of the planet who is sovereign, who owns the planet, who has reserved the planet for the day of the Lord. And yet people believe things because they're ungrateful. They're unthankful to God. Now listen, if you do take notes, write this down. What you're thankful for, you retain. If you go on and read, these people lost the knowledge of God and three times it says they were given over to the lust of their flesh. Three times God gave them over. Three times because they refused to retain God. They refused to glorify him as God and say, thank you. Their minds were darkened. They became foolish in their hearts. And then they were given over to the desires of their flesh. One of the worst judgments that God can ever give to anyone is to give you what you want independent of his will for your life. Give you over to what you want. Israel insisted on having a king. God didn't want them to have a king. God was gonna be and was their king. And they pushed him and they pushed him. We want a king, we want a king. And the worst judgment God ever exercised on Israel was giving them what they wanted independent of his plan and will for their life. Amen. And the kings created more problems in their history than anything else. Ask Pharaoh, do you want God to give you the desire of your heart independent of his will? Pharaoh hardened his heart and hardened his heart. He desired a hard heart. He insisted on hardening his heart. And God's worst judgment on Pharaoh was giving him the desire of his heart. God hardened his heart for his glory, for his glory. Romans chapter one, the worst judgment God could give us is what we want and insist independent of his will for our lives. They refused to glorify God and give him thanks. So ultimately they were given over to a reprobate mind a mind void of the knowledge of God. See, what you're ungrateful and unthankful for, you lose. If you're ungrateful for God, ungrateful and unthankful to God, you do not retain him in your, in your mind. So you could say it this way, what you're thankful for, you retain. What you're unthankful for, you lose. And man, I see it every day. People so unthankful for their jobs. Even believe God wants a better job for them. And there's nothing wrong for you, for, with you believing for a better job, even wanting a better job. But you have to be thankful for the job you have before you're going to get the job God wants you to have so that when you get there, you'll be thankful for that job. Because what you're unthankful for, you lose. How are we losing one of the greatest nations that has ever existed on the planet in the existence of the human race. How can we be losing it? Ungratefulness, unthankfulness. Talk to the average lost person. 
They are full of ungratefulness. They do not glorify God. They're not thankful for their freedom. They're not thankful for, for the freedom to move about, the freedom of thought, the freedom of speech, freedom, liberties that come from God, not man, that cannot be taken away by man because they come from God. But the ungratefulness and the unthankfulness of what we have is what you will lose. Well, y'all aren't shouting. Well, no, that's all right. Jubilee starts tomorrow night, and so I'll, I'll be on the front row shouting. I'm going to be thankful for my, for my marriage. I'm going to be thankful for my children. It doesn't mean I don't have problems. It doesn't mean there aren't adjustments that have to be made. It doesn't mean there aren't problems and things in your life, but you have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. You have to see like Jesus saw. He saw them healed, all of them, and was surprised that only one came back and said thanks. I want to be the guy that surprises Jesus and comes back and says thanks. Not the guy that is ungrateful, unthankful, nothing's ever right, nothing's ever good enough. Boy, I'm preaching myself happy. Are you getting this, honey? Hallelujah. I'm thankful for you. Praise God. You need to say thank you to people. Amen. I, I wish I could stay on it because you did not respond very well. Number two, go to Genesis 22. But I'm thankful you're here. And I'm thankful for those that did respond. And those responses right there are from the heart. I'm so thankful for them. The two people at the back that stood up and gave me a standing ovation. I'm so thankful for you. I know y'all didn't see it, but I saw it in Jesus' name. I'm, I'm glad I'm here too. And I'm thankful to be here. Genesis 22. The second thing the Lord spoke to me and established a sanctified week was the offering of Isaac by Abraham and the power of that act of faith. I, I, I think for years I sort of took for granted Abraham offering Isaac, but well, when you read it and you pray and you meditate and you see it, you put yourself in the place of it. How many of you know the Holy Spirit was there? So when you by faith put yourself there, the same Holy Spirit that was there in person makes it alive on the inside of you. And so in meditating on this, in thinking about this, it's just amazing what an act of faith. Father Abraham, the father of our faith, exercised in the offering of Isaac. So we're going to read this. There's so much. You could spend quite a few weeks with the nuggets in here, but I want to tie them into Jubilee. And what is Jubilee all about? We, we say thank you for a whole year of what God has done all the baptisms, all the healings, all the salvations. I mean, there's some churches that you don't see anybody saved in a whole year. And, and we're seeing people by the hundreds being saved. And there's a great harvest out there and God is sending us as laborers into the harvest. So I'm just saying, thank you for allowing us to be a laborer, God. And so we, we say, thank you for what he's done. Then the second part of Jubilee is what is God saying to us? What is God saying to us? Yes, God speaks to you individually and you need to learn that still small voice. And yes, God guides you in your life and in the decision-making that takes place in your life every day because the quality of your life is gonna be based on the decisions you make led by the Holy Spirit. So we all need individually to be led, but does God say things corporately? The book of Revelation chapter two and, verse, and, and chapter three, God specifically spoke to the churches. He specifically said, man, you're doing good. He knew what they were doing. Sorry. I feel like a little kid and I know I'm able to believe in big stuff. But I believe Jesus goes to church. And I do believe he walks up and down in the midst of the candlesticks. And I do believe he sees our works. And I do believe at times he says, hey, you're doing really good, but you need to straighten this out. I'm not happy about this. I guarantee you, you can count probably on two hands how many pastors believe 
Jesus is watching what they're doing and he's either going to affirm it or he's going to adjust it. And yet the book of Revelation, all seven churches, he said something different to each church. That's important. This is awesome. Abraham. Genesis 22, 1, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. I don't have time to explain the difference between testing and tempting. Tempting involves sin and Satan. Testing involves our faithfulness to God. And if we're not faithful in a little, we won't be able to be made rulers of much. There's testings with our relationship and our faith with God. And he said, here am I. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. I was going to read. I just can't read the whole thing. Abraham, offer your son a sacrifice on a mountain I will show you. Why not just tell him which mountain? Because see, we don't understand faith obedience today determines your instructions from God tomorrow. Your faith obedience today matters in little things. We want to know what do you got for me, God? What do you got for me five years from now? I'm not saying God doesn't give us vision. I'm saying instruction comes through faith obedience. And if you're not willing to do what he tells you today, why would he tell you what to do tomorrow? I'm a good father. I'm not going to give instructions a week down the road for my kids to do when they won't do what I'm telling them to do today. Amen. Your faith obedience today determines your instructions in faith tomorrow. So offer your son. He has to choose. Am I going to obey or not? Am I going to walk by faith or not? Do I see what God is saying? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to light your fire here in a minute. Now, well, I am going to do it, but some of you won't get lit. But I'm going to light my fire here in just a minute. Because he, he saw it. God speaks to him. Offer your son, the son you love, the promised seed. As a sacrifice. On a mountain, I will show you. Now look at the next verse. So Abram, Abraham rose early in the morning. He didn't lose any sleep, amen? He rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him. You got to remember that took two of his young men, young servants with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, everybody say the third day. day. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I We'll go yonder. He was from Texas or southeastern Oklahoma. (laughs) That's the promised land. Don't misunderstand. I and the lad, we're going to go yonder. Hallelujah. We're going to go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. We will come back to you. We will come back to you. We, we, me and this boy, we'll come back to you. We. Not me, we will come back to you. Wow. How many days journey? Three days. See, Galatians 3.8 says that God preached the gospel to Abraham. See, there's not an Old Testament gospel and a New Testament gospel There's always been one gospel. And the Bible says in Galatians 3, 8, that God preached the gospel. Everybody say the gospel. The gospel gospel to Abraham. 
First Corinthians chapter 15, verses one through four says the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the third day. When God spoke to this man, he saw the gospel, he knew the gospel because he had faith and faith has always been in the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Isaac was three days dead to him as they were looking for the mountain to offer him on. He'd already in his heart sacrificed Isaac. And for three days, Isaac is dead to him. Three days. See, he didn't wait till he, see, this is our problem. He didn't wait till he got there, put him on the altar and then, well, what am I gonna do? Do I obey God? Do I go through with this? Do no, he'd already seen it in his heart. He'd already been preached the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of the promised seed. He'd already been told, I'm sorry, I'm about to preach, that Isaac is the promised seed. And for three days, he saw himself sacrifice the promised seed. So by the time he got there, he looks at the two men and says, me and this boy are coming back. I'm gonna sacrifice him because he's a type and a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised seed, but he will be raised again and I've already seen him dead for three days, so I'm gonna kill him. God's gonna raise him from the dead and we're coming off of this mountain having a jubilee, hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. So now he's dead three days in his heart. It's been a total of four days. And now God says, and the scriptures say, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand, put the wood on top of the boy. He got fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, hey, dad, Good old dad, best dad ever, kind of like best papa ever. Sorry, you get these moments, you take advantage of them, hallelujah. My father, here am I, my son. Then he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? We've, we've played this game before, Dad. And there's always three things. There's wood, fire, and a lamb. Now, we talk about the faith of Abraham, and, and if I, I get off here, I'll, I'll run out of time. And, and the faith of Abraham's over the top. But to this day, I've never heard anybody talk about Isaac. What about his faith? What about his honor and obedience to his dad? How many of you could have even tied your boy up? You'd have been running around that mountain for another three days trying to catch him. How many kids are obedient enough, honor enough, obey enough, trust enough to let you tie their hands up and put them on an altar and they stay on it? I mean, most boys would have been running home to mama running daddy down. That boy let him tie his hands, put him up on the altar, and he just asked, this looks a little odd. <laughs> I just put myself in his place and it's like, there's the wood, there's the fire. What's going on here, dad? Look at the answer. And Abram said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Think of the faith that the Lord will provide himself. I don't know exactly what's going on. My faith is being tested, but God said, do this. But I've, I've heard the gospel. I know the gospel. And the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the promised seed. And God will provide himself a lamb, whether it, it's provided right here in type and shadow, I know I've already seen the gospel and what's gonna happen in type and shadow is I'm gonna obey the father, but me and this boy are coming off of this mountain. Yeah. 
Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But an angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes, looked and there behind him was a 14 point Pope and Young trophy buck. I believe I receive. Caught in the thing. I've prayed this a lot in a deer stand. Just tie one up for me, Lord. I'm busy. Sorry, that was, let that go. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham and went and took the ram and offered it, for, it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place. The Lord will provide. King James Bible says, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. See, God sees and God provides. We must learn to see and believe he provides. There's so much again. But as it relates to Jubilee, we celebrate in thanksgiving what we know God has said. But a part of that sanctified week is, what is God saying to us? And are we present? I'm not talking about physical presence. I know at this particular location, many of you just can't possibly even be there. But I'm saying as a church, are we present to hear what God is saying to us? Not just what he said. We have to operate constantly in what he has said. But we have to be fully present to hear what he's saying. Because one day you wake up, offer your son a sacrifice to me. Four days later, do thy son no harm. It's not that God changed his mind. Some of you can take what I'm saying and and say, well, God said to me to do this today, but he's telling me the opposite or told me yesterday to do this, but today he's telling me the opposite. And you just use stuff like that to still be led by your flesh as if God is that schizophrenic in his will for your life. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying when we hear even the voice of God, we have to stay present to that assignment because it could be a test. It could be a season. Everything God's ever said to me had a shelf life. I'm not saying he changed his mind. I'm saying it ran its course that he told me to do this and I did it. And that was a season within the divine purposes of God that now I need to hear him. What now? What mountain? You got me here. I obeyed you and I got here. But you have to constantly be present to the Lord to hear what mountain now you're to offer the sacrifice. And many churches, they don't check into God and with God for their church, maybe once a decade. I guarantee you, I've got some charismatic friends. They'd have killed that boy no matter what on the fourth day. (laughs) That God told me to kill him. And I can't tell you over the years. Now, listen, I'm I'm trying to help you. If you want help, I can help anybody if they want help. But many times I'll ask people, what God said, and then I'll, I'll begin to try to process that. And they'll take it like I'm questioning whether or not they heard God. No, I know you heard God. I know every student at Karis has heard God and he sent them here, but they better be aware he sent them here to get them in our church. Go to Karis and I'll show you what church. You must offer the sacrifice of praise. (laughs) 
Oh, let it go. (laughs) Amen. You're really not listening. Yeah, God told me to do this, but was it for a season? Was it for preparation? God sends us places all the time to take us from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from one measure of grace to another measure of grace in our lives. So we have to listen. We have to hear. He heard God sacrifice the boy. But four days later, he heard God, don't kill him. I know now. I know now that you fear God. I know now that you understand the full scope of the gospel. That the Father God would give his beloved son that the father God would give the son he loves so much for the sacrifice of the sins of the world and that that son would die a horrible, horrific, sacrificial death and be buried for three days. But on the third day, that boy, God's boy is coming out of the grave, hallelujah. And now make salvation available to the whole world. Abraham saw all that and knew this boy is a miracle boy. I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even conceive this boy till I was a hundred years old. Sarah was 90 years old. She couldn't hardly wash dishes, much less make babies. He stood before God and found out God quickens dead things. Don't make me explain that. (laughs) That this boy is a miracle boy. He's the the promised seed, not Messiah, but the promised seed of a faith child, a miracle child, a type and a shadow. And I know that I know I'm not losing a boy. I'm showing God, I believe I will one day be the father of many nations, not the Jew only, but the Gentile also, because that's the gospel. The gospel isn't for the Jew only. The gospel is for the Jew and the Gentile. And now because of Abraham's faith in the promised seed and being willing to sacrifice his own son, the heavenly father in covenant gave his only son and made Abraham now the father of many nations and thousands of years later, we're gathered together saying, thank you, Father Abraham, for showing us how faith works, hallelujah. And we're gonna be attentive to the voice of God. We're gonna check in. We're gonna come back every year and we're gonna say thank you, which takes the whole week. We got so much to be grateful for. Every Everything in Victory Life Church has come out of Jubilee. Every major adjustment has come out of Jubilee because we do hear God. And many times we realize that that was a seasonal word and we were obedient in the little and God's gonna make us ruler of much. In Matthew chapter four, verse four, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word, listen, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Holy Spirit that the Father sent is the voice of God on the inside of you that's leading you that is a proceeding word. You know, I don't wanna call names, Good or bad, it just gets you in trouble. But I'm just looking at Antoinette and, you know, watching her come into into the ministry and like one of my own children just evolving in front of Sue and I and turning into the beautiful woman and minister that she is. And I've watched her for, for years obey God. She doesn't even know I'm watching her. Kind of like my kids. My grandkids don't know I'm watching them right now. (laughs) But watching my kids, 
watching my kids, obeying the little and then watch God promote them. And then they're obedient there and watch God promote them. She and many of you will be a part of truly a third great awakening. We have an opportunity few generations have had. And while in the natural, it looks like things are collapsing in the church world at large, God's purging the church. God's pruning the church. God's speaking to the church. And the lamp, the lamp stands that he takes away in the, in the book of Revelation, the churches that he closes down and removes their lampstand. Listen, their light went out long before he removed their lampstand. Why do I know we'll have a lampstand? God will have a lampstand right here. It's because we will refuse to let our lights go out, but our lights will shine individually and our lights will shine corporately in worship of God, in giving him glory, in giving him thanks, in returning habitually. I'm not saying we just give thanks once a year. I'm saying if you do this right between now and next Jubilee, you'll have a blowout next Jubilee because every day you're gonna say thank you and thank you and thank you. And then you're not only gonna retain God in your minds, you're going to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and you're gonna absolutely with those that have grown with you have an explosion. I've had visions of Jubilees here. That's why we gotta get this building built. We gotta get this building built because I know I know that we will not ever have our lampstand removed. I know that God wants to shine on the side of that mountain. That I mean, it's going to shine, shine bright. Many of us will be dead and gone in the presence of God, but there'll be a light shining on this mountain in the name of Jesus. Not just from the school, thank God for the school. Thank God for this school. Thank God for my beloved brother and what God's doing in his life. But even the students have no idea everything they're learning is for a bride and to be a bride. And Jesus isn't coming back for a Bible school. He's coming back for a church that is without spot or without blemish, loyal to her husband, Jesus Christ. And I really believe God through the school is gonna raise up a loyal group, a passionate group that are gonna be a part of the bride of Christ that Jesus already sees. Man, I'm just glad when Jesus looks at us, he sees a trophy bride, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I just believe I receive. I believe that we are a trophy bride to the Lord. And that if he showed up to seven churches, I at least wanna be there were only two out of the seven that he didn't correct. Only two that he didn't have to chasten. Why is that? Because they were receiving his chastening and his correction and his discipling every day. And so when he finally showed up and manifest, he said, y'all were just doing great. Get after it. Hallelujah. That's what I want to hear. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. Father, I thank you for this week. I thank you, Holy Spirit. You're the proceeding Word of God. You speak, you lead, you guide, you give us visions, hopes, and dreams. You show us the mountains that we're to make certain sacrifices on. As we obey today, our instructions for tomorrow become clearer and clearer. I set myself in agreement with everybody that needs a word from the Lord. I set myself in agreement for the business community that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. We wanna see the transfer. We need a transfer. I know it's laid up for the righteous, but it needs to be released to the righteous. And so we call forth the finances to do all you've called us to do. Every seed sown, I speak a blessing on the harvest. Thank you for us retaining what we're thankful for. Thank you for our spouses. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for our churches. And I just 
glorify you in all that's been done. But I anticipate great and mighty things. And it's all in your name and for your glory. Amen and amen. Somebody give Jesus thanks. Woo!